Hi there, Glocal citizens. Welcome back to the podcast that inspires a borderless mindset around manifesting a new world. I am your host, Florence Adu, coming to you with part two of my conversation with Isis Asari. Isis once described herself as using her overpriced education, love for technology, and acumen for experimentation to hack Hollywood. This is where her first entrepreneurial enterprise, Sista Cinema, emerged. With Sista Cinema, her goal was to be a part of a movement to create a global market for independent film, fostering deep, engaging discussions about the difficult issues of gender, sexuality, race, and class. In 2015, she successfully exited by selling the platform to community investors. A serial cultural entrepreneur, she has since launched Sista Sci-Fi, the first Black-owned bookstore focused on Afrofuturism, Indigenous futurism, science fiction, and fantasy in the United States. So if you didn't catch us last week, please do go back and listen to her full bio because she's done some very impressive things. And also you'll get caught up to where we are in the conversation. So right now we're joining the conversation where Isis is telling us about how Sista Sci-Fi came to be. So let's talk about how Sister Sci-Fi came into being. So tell us how you just were like, I'm doing this. I love sci-fi. I'm doing this. It's just going to be what I do. Yeah. Okay. That's the question I'm ready to answer. So a friend and I, Jen May, which we had an accountability call at 11, so I'll text her. We were discussing Lilith's Brood. And we're done. She started naming. She's like, I'm sure you know Nettie Corpor and Tommy Ademi and Jen May probably named a bunch of others. And I was like, no. And I, and I felt some kind of way because, you know, I had really focused a lot of my reading on Black literature and I'm a first generation West African like these authors. So it's like, how, did, how do I not know? How did I miss all the memos? And so I wanted to read them. I wanted to discuss them. And I didn't want anybody else to miss the memo. And that's how Sister Sci-Fi started. I was thinking it would be like model well-read Black girl, but focus on science fiction and fantasy. So more book club esque and more event-based. But at the time, I was working at Amazon because I love selling stuff online. Sister Sci-Fi could be an online bookstore. And that just kind of like clicked for me. I'm like, yeah, you know, I could sell books online. And so that's, that's been fun. Interesting because, you know, well, most people know that Amazon started as a bookseller, right? And so yeah. then it became this other thing. So tell us a little bit more about, so what, what exactly were you doing at Amazon? And I don't know, most people probably don't know this, but Amazon is a behemoth and there's so many online functionalities, right? So it goes way beyond just what they sell. Like the back end technology is where their, their bread and butter actually really is. So What was your experience or or your role with them? I was at Amazon for four years. I had three different roles, which is a fairly typical Amazon experience, Um, but in more in different and very different organizations. So I went in with a in a with a finance role in our international consumer finance, which is financial planning and analysis for everything outside of North America. So it's like, what's our forecast and what's our budget for Germany, EMEA, like what's our rollout for Australia, et cetera. So that was my first show. Within that role, one of the teams was global vendor management, which is identifying and executing growth opportunities for brands internationally with Amazon. Um, So that was more of a business development role. So I was in that role and worked with brands like Nestle, 3M, Under Armour, and like, what are some initiatives that you, that these brands can partner with, with Amazon to like grow their sales in India or China with Amazon. So that was fun. And then my last role was, I was actually a senior vendor manager, which is like the equivalent of a buyer in like Amazon Fresh, which was their grocery department. So it was at the time, this was there like right before the pandemic. So there's a lot of like growing it, scaling it out, launching new cities and hubs. I like ran bakery. So that really taught me a lot about selection and looking at your metrics and like, what is it like running an e-commerce business? And what are you looking at? Um, and like, how do you look at these dashboards? And like, when you're like, wait, sit on the crap and watch this crap. 
Is it like we don't have the products? Is it because we have the listing, but they're out of stock? Is it because the products are selling out? Like it's not listed, all that troubleshooting and so forth. And then like, oh, we had the sales, but we ain't got no profit. Like, what is that about? So, uh, and then like, who do you work with? Who do you coordinate with? And there's the sales aspect of it, but there's also like other revenue drivers, as you were saying. So there's always trying to get brands to like invest more in like advertising with Amazon, which is a big part, which is a lot of stuff that I like. I think about like there's, I sell books, but it's like now that I scaled, it was so interesting. I forgot that that point to contact number for Sister Cinema was in there 10,000 because right now Sister Sci-Fi is just under 45,000. And I'm at the point where I'm like, yeah, I've created this brand. I have this tunnel, like customers trust me, like publishers, if you want to work with me, we got to start writing some text, which is definitely like a framework that I developed working at Amazon. So I, I think that's a real lesson or an understanding is that how you leverage that big business experience to your small business and and really ensuring growth. When I hear you speak about how you go about it, it's like, oh yeah, you really understand how this is a business, right? It's something that you love, but you truly understand how it is a business in terms of the marketing, the targeting, and looking at the metrics and be able to sell that metric to those who you want to partner with or to bring into the fold to increase visibility, Mm -hmm. et cetera. And so that's how it started. So explain what it is now. It's so interesting, folks, because I started following Isis on Instagram just because I was like, ooh, Sister Sci-Fi just came in my feed. I was like, ooh, yay, I love sci-fi. So like a lot of the authors that I read were in there and just obviously a lot of like Octavia Butler, like there's so much. And I've just loved mm-hmm. to like see what was going on in the space. And so I was talking to a friend in New York and he was like, you know, you should meet someone for, you know, I think you all would hit it off. It'd be great. I was like, oh, okay. He said her name. I was like, oh, okay. And he's like, yeah, she runs this. I was like, oh my gosh, I follow her on Instagram. <laughs> I mean, you probably, I thought it was very I thought like our friend told you about me and then you're like, oh, let me check out this sci-fi. So that, oh, this is cool. I love it. Yeah. I told him, I was like, I follow her on Instagram. I was like, oh yeah. Yeah. No, I've been following you for I'm on, at least a year. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like through COVID. So yeah. So I was a part of this organization called Sister Business. Like we had to sit down and write our ideal customer and point your like 100% who Sister Sci-Fi is built for. Highly educated, entrepreneurial, like active on social media, like a leader in your community and taking the themes of these books and applying it to real life. Like not like reading for escape, reading for leisure, not that there's anything wrong with that, but like reading Parable of the Sword and you put the book down and you're like, where's my go back? How do I build community? How do I build scalable? And and then like, that's what you do every day. How do I create and manifest and change the world? So, oh, they're like, that's so proud of me. What is Sister Sci-Fi? So there's the high level book. Point. So, Sci Fi is the first black owned bookstore focused on science fiction and fantasy in the US. And like two years ago, I said this to like a mentor. I'm also part of the Oakland Black Business Fund. And so, we're meeting weekly while I was thinking about like growth strategies. And at first, I was like, Sister Sci Fi is the first black owned bookstore, black owned science fiction and fantasy bookstore. And he was like, ever in the US, globally? Did you validate that? And I was like, oh, that's fair. So, I added anyway. <laughs> And I asked the American Booksellers Association, I was like, am I the first? And they're like, to our knowledge, there hasn't been anybody else. I was like, I'm a with that. And I asked a couple or a couple other organizations. So that's not just something I'm pulling out my butt anymore. That's validated. And we're located primarily in cyberspace. I say that because it sounds really cool and it's on brand. But what that means is like we're online first, right? So like, if you want to buy a book from us or most of our selection is available online at www.sistersci-fi.com. You can also buy books through our Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter shop. We're working on TikTok. Let's see how that goes. And in February, we became, Sister Sci-Fi became an omni-channel retailer. So we launched our first three Sister Sci-Fi book vending machines in Oakland, California, downtown Oakland. So I walked there about a couple of times a week. I'll be there tomorrow. And then in Washington State, so in Shoreline and in Mill Creek, and all the locations are Black women-owned coffee shops. So they're places where people in the community gather and come together, people of all ages. And then like now when they're there, they can buy a book from these, the Sci-Fi book vending machines. 
they're the first sister sci-fi book vending machines. I'm not saying I'm the first person to launch a book vending machine. Well, because the technology had to be there, right? It was kind of easy to access. So, yeah. But it's a great idea. I love that concept because, you know, the vending machine has come a long way. And so, you know, when I saw, started to see them change up in airports, I'm like, oh my gosh, really? This is like so interesting. And so tell us a little bit more about the logistics of managing that kind of, you know, physical existence, right? Whenever I remember the vending machine, there's always someone that would have to come, refill it take the money, hope people don't vandalize. So, you know, you're obviously in safe spaces and I want you to tell us a little bit more about how you decided what locations that you were going to place the first ones. But yeah, tell us about how um, being a vending machine owner and manager is for you. It's very different from online. <laughs> and I didn't realize how much. I was like, oh, this is very different from online. So there was a lot to learn. So in terms of picking the locations, my particularly for the first three, my focus was people or people, places or people come to gather, right? Because a lot of times I get the question, so where's the brick and mortar bookstore, right? And running while independent bookstores and physical locations is a key part to society, right? And, you know, they deserve to be there. Even though I have a bookstore, I still patron Marcus Bookstore whenever it makes sense. And that's also located in like more uptown Oakland. So like physical brick and mortar bookstores are a prime part of society. I don't want to run a traditional <laughs> brick and mortar bookstore. I got to be there from 10 to 5 p.m. or like find somebody to be there and do the cash shows. All this so then I was like, how do I answer that question? Because people are asking, not because a buying need because it's much easier to buy on the website, but they wanted to come in and sit in that community, right? They want to have conversations about the books. And I'm like, how can I offer that? And I was like, having a book vent, a sister sci fi book vending machine and a black owned coffee shop where people come together is an answer to that. So that sounds like so places where there's a level of comfort where there's room for the vending machine where we could do events and that either were open Saturday and Sunday or convenient hours or had a path to being open Saturday and Sunday. And, you know, places that said yes in the beginning was like, will you just say yes? Now, because we've, we're starting to get press coverage, there's a lot of people like coming to me and saying like, oh, this is a side book vending machine, which is great. And now there are other roadblocks, but so now it's like more interest, which is really exciting. So that is how I picked those three locations and why launching a sister sci-fi book vending machine was important. Like I wanted people to be able to see the books and access the books outside of going to the site. And then when I first started sister sci-fi, I was doing a lot of pop-up vending because people were like, I don't know what sister sci-fi is. I'm definitely not going to the site. Right. So I needed to do pop-ups so like I could introduce people to the brand and to the experience. So yes, yeah, so I needed a place where people could buy the book and discover the, my curation of books. If they had not discovered the website or if I wasn't pop-up vending and also a place for people who did know the brand who were looking for community and to connect with folks in real life in person. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So you just brought up an interesting question about shelf space because you know each of your aisles in the machine is a shelf space. So do you, have you curated any of them like specifically for the locations? I know one of them isn't really a meaningful location in Washington. And so are you curating the books, what's on available in each of them differently, or are they pretty much, you know, you have your books of the month and then you rotate them? Great question. Curation is always like for the site and now the machines. There's no way. For the first month for February, it's like, what do I have in stock and what can I put in these machines? So I was just like, I got, I got books for the website. Now there'll be books for the machine. And I would say 80% of the titles are consistent across all three machines. And there's some like local nuance. As you were saying about Shoreline Lake Forest, that's the chosen home of Octavia E. Butler. So there's definitely Octavia E. Butler titles there. At launch, we also had Octavia's Brood, which is an anthology of short stories. And several of like the contributors and I think the editor are based in the Pacific Northwest. So that was really important to have in that machine. Here in Oakland at launch, we had Dream Journal, which is an independent author. She's also based here in Oakland. And I wanted to say, yeah, because we had our, I also have like an Afrofuturism coloring book, which is just 
in Oakland because it's the city where magic happens. And in the Mill Creek location, that is the one location where we carry Who Fears Death by Nettie before. And yeah, so those are those three locations and some regional differences. As I think about new locations, I have about six locations who are confirmed to launch sometime this year. I was hoping June, knock on wood. It is almost May, it's April, it's about to be April. So I'm going to follow the wisdom of the universe. But for example, the Northwest African American Museum is super interested. So their book titles were Black and Indigenous Reflective Fiction authors based in the broader Pacific Northwest. So the museum defines the big Pacific Northwest anywhere from Washington to Idaho to Montana. Like it's a big thought of the Pacific Northwest, Washington and Oregon. And so, yeah, so that'll be the regional focus. We're thinking about having something at the American Writers Museum in Chicago. It will still have books, but it'll also have books about the author's lives and books about writing science fiction and fantasy, so more resource books. There's a possibility of a university setting. And again, those those books will be more reference books about like machine, Afrofuturism, a History of Black Features, which is a companion piece for the Afrofuturism exhibit at the National Museum of African American History and Culture. So again, in that machine, it'll be more reference in academic books as opposed to, which are also important, as opposed to the more fantasy fiction books. And most machines carry, the, book, the machines that are launched now carry books for readers of all ages, from like the newest readers to established readers. Wow. I love that. I, I so much love. So uh, when did I first fall in love with science fiction? I can say that a time that I did felt like I was kind of a Trekkie, but it kind of annoyed me. But when I was really, <laughs> you know, Lost in Space was on and all those things. But I don't know if you remember, and this could be dating me, is um, the show Quantum Leap. Oh, yes. Sam Beckett. Yes. 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 That was like, oh my gosh, I love that. You know, so that was one of my major, oh, I love science fiction. But then I want to say that the book that probably, you know, paved the way was Brave New World. Yeah. And and so that was, wow, this is like a real, you know, that is science fiction, right? It's like speculative. Yeah. 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 It was definitely kind of science fiction. And I mean, like the thing is that Brave New Worlds and Corrupt was written in the 1930s. So like it's stuff that like for that time period, and let me know if I'm wrong, because I'm really bad with it. Stuff that was science fiction then, like women taking chemicals to like, to control, like. <laughs> it was like, so I'm I'm now reading, I, I never was on the Handmaid's Tale bandwagon, but I'm reading it now. So in that controlled society where you have, you know, your A's, your alphas, your betas, your whatevers. And I was like, yeah, that was that story. Yeah. So Brave New World definitely counts two things. Peacock had a, a television adaption of Brave New World. Ah, yeah, I, re- I remember. I haven't watched it, but I remember. Yeah, I really enjoyed it and it wasn't. And there was like one Black character and she was being Black was not a big part of her storyline, but I still really enjoyed it. I think it departs wildly from the books. So just Yeah, keep it in mind. Mm-hmm. And there's supposed to be, I think there's a new Quantum Leap on NBC. Really? I heard some rumblings about it. And then the other one is, and this was really crazy because we watched this in school and I don't know why, of uh, Logan's Run. Oh, yeah. That was like psychedelic. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, it was funny. And and yeah, that's how I wouldn't have known it otherwise. I'm like, Logan's Run. And it really is, uh, they're on a ship. I'm just going to leave that there, folks. Look up Logan's Run because then you'll start to understand like it's in that brave new, like this brave new world kind of vein of things. But it's about this these people on a ship and then they emerge into like a brave, a new world ultimately. But it was done in this, it's like, it's a disc, I don't want to say disco, but like a, <laughs> a psychedelic sci-fi, psych, sci-fi story. Okay. Okay. Logan's run. I'll, I'll look at that. The love of the Black science fiction obviously started with Octavia Butler for me, you know, so that's where, where that started. And then I just feel so fortunate to have just kind of found my way through so many others. And there's a, there's a title right behind your head that I love. And I think it's a very underrated or or not so well known author River Solomon and Unkindness of Ghosts. I really enjoyed that book. Yes, yeah, so these are fun things you can do when you a bookstore. This book was one of Rivers. I think it was their first published novel. 
from the smaller. And so I was able to, so it's signed. And this is actually a hardcover. So, uh, so a kindness of ghosts and a kindness of ghosts was actually was printed straight to paperback. And I was like, oh, but I want hardcover. I want a signed hardcover. And so the, the publisher was like, okay, we can make that happen. Yeah. So I think when I think of Unkindness of Ghosts, which I discovered through a book club, it really represents everything that I want Sister Sci-Fi to be about. The rivers themselves is neurodivergent, as is the main character, Aster, as you know. <laughs> when the book club was, when I read the synopsis, is you take the societal structure of the antebellum South and you put it on a spaceship 200 years in the future. I was like, mm-hmm, I'm not about that life. Aster is so smart and so empowered. I love, I was like, I don't know nothing about botany, but I loved reading Aster talk about and discuss botany. I feel like I'm more- I'm a science geek at the end of the day, like I really kind of am. So that was a big part of it. Like, oh, wow, that's like so interesting. And then you have Giselle. And can I tell you, Giselle's time is so hard, but I was three, but like Giselle, equal parts, she drove me crazy. And like, I was like in love. You are literally driving me crazy right now, but you're such a compelling character and you're driving me crazy. That's what I love when an author can really give you those characters that you're like, I hate this character. Like, or you just have to get yourself around them and you're like, ugh. So, yes, I love and kindness of ghost. I have The World We Make and the City We Became by N.K. Jemison. So yeah, there was just like a lot to discover in the space. And like I would tell people about it, like, yeah, you know, this is what I'm doing. And they're like, yeah, because publishers don't publish the book. I was like, no. Publishers publish a lot of books in the space. Like there are a lot of writers in the space. Like there's a plethora, and I think, but just most readers, even if you're a sci-fi enthusiast, may not know, right? Like so much at the intersection of black. And I expanded indigenous culture because it was like the one, the one culture that gets even less shine than black people are indigenous people. So I was like, I had to, right? So. There's a lot at the intersection of, of Black and Indigenous culture and science fiction. It's just like, it's just hard to find because you're not going to go and like search an Amazon Black and Indigenous science fiction. Yeah, I like that too, because yeah, there's not a lot of shine. And the magic of it is part of, I think, what attracts me. And I think Indigenous cultures have this magic that is, I, I think, probably inherently part of most of their um, fantasy science fiction that... I just am interested in and want to know more about. And I think that also is what's communicated in a lot of a black science fiction and fantasy is, is, is that. Okay. So thinking about what people like and what people don't like, I want to ask you about a mindset hack. So this is something that you practice or something that you know of, and it is what you do to kind of get your mind in a different zone your favorite or innovative mindset hack? So something that you do, that you practice, or one that you can imagine, you know, like we're in this imaginative space. So one that you do practice or can imagine. I'll give you a couple. I'll give you like literally three and you can like, you like none of these answer the question and then um, feedback. (laughs) So one, so I've worked a 12 step program. And so one of the, it gave me a lot of gifts, but one gifts daily, early morning meditation, five minutes. And when I started, I was like, there's no way I would ever get up daily at 5 a.m. to meditate. But I do. And it, it's super grounding and it's created like a lot of mental spaciousness for me. So that's like, that's a practice and a mindset. And I've literally stripped it down to the bare essentials. So there's no going to a meditation studio. It's like me I'm half asleep. I'm listening to the app. Sometimes I go back to sleep. Sometimes I wake up. But it does help ground and set me for the start of the day. So that's one. Two is being clear and communicating my boundaries. I think particularly as an entrepreneur, right? <laughs> my first month, I was like, why does it feel, why does it still feel so draining? My first month of entrepreneurship, right? And I was like, I don't know. So, and I sat with, I'm only going to take meetings Tuesdays and Thursdays and just create space for all that other kind of stuff. And I was like, I wonder So I think I said that like two years ago and it just, it it has allowed so much for me and I have to actively communicate and I have to keep saying that like, like, well, like, but what about this day? I was like, that is not a Tuesday or Thursday. Come again. Right. (laughs) Like, and at one moment I was like, I only take Mondays, Tuesdays and Thursdays. She's like, it's so great that you only work Tuesdays and Thursdays. And I was like, it's like, no, that's not what I said. (laughs) (laughs) I was like, not not what I said. (laughs) So yeah, so that was that. And then 
So the third one is really, which is the hardest one, being okay with flight, really focusing and letting some stuff go, right? So one of my partners and I, we did a ceremony like, okay, so what are our goals? What are our big rocks for this year? And like, mine is I want to launch 10, mine is very explicit. I want to launch 10 sister sci-fi book vending machines by June of this year. And it's according to the wisdom of the universe, he's like, oh, that's great. Like, what are you going to give up? What are you going to sacrifice? I was like, sacrifice. Then like everything in me was just like, I don't want to. And he's like, well, you know, that's going to take a lot of mental energy. Like, what are you going to like not do to create space for that? And I was like, I was like, this year, I'm not going to do any in-person vending. Like it takes a lot of energy. Like it takes bandwidth. And so like, that is something that I sacrifice, which is something like, I have to sit with as an entrepreneur. I can't do everything. I can't serve everybody. I have to be intentional about like where I do decide to show up and I have to let some stuff go. I had a customer the other day who was like, I'm like, okay, I hear you. And at this point, Sister Sci-Fi is not the store for you. And that is okay for the both of us, right? <laughs> like, it's okay. And not like, oh my, like I, and it's like, right now, it's okay. Yeah. I love those. Those are great. And it's interesting that the question was, what are you giving up? That's the reality of being. And you you said you're a solopreneur for the most part. And I, I think I am as well, right? I, I organize teams, right? So I work with teams and, and I think a lot of people are in that space. And a lot of mine is by choice because of the challenge of managing and growing. At some point, I feel like I definitely want to grow talent and grow capacity in people, particularly here in Ghana. But it's just more efficient and effective for me to manage teams of people who are of a certain capacity, right? And so to your point, I have learned how to give stuff up, obviously, because Ghana has its limitations, et cetera. That's a real reality is that you have to know what you, not even sacrificing, but just putting to another place or at another time to hit those goals. So I thank you for that. I really appreciate that share. Yeah, it's an important mindset because what I realized is that for me, I can intentionally take something off my plate or the universe will take something off my plate for me. So so it's like one way or another is going to happen. So Yeah. Right, exactly. So you kind of told us what's new and what's next and what you're working on. And I love that. Is there anything else that you want to share about what's going on with Sister Sci-Fi? Um, yeah, I think I'm really, right now, I'm really excited about the Sister Sci-Fi book vending machines. I'm really excited to like bring, allow people to like see the books. I mean, you can't like open them and flip through them, but each, and when you go to a vending machine, each book has a QR code. So you can like, scan that and go to like the detail page on Sister Sci Fi to make discovery a bit easier. So I'm just, I'm excited about that. I love Sister Sci Fi Wind Down Wednesdays. Those are like weekly discussions, mostly with authors, but just people doing stuff in the space. I mean, if you want to, you should be on Sister. It's super, 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 super low key. Right? Like, yeah, yeah, I've watched. <laughs> it's just like a fun time. <laughs> okay, I was just like, <laughs> yeah, it's so like super lucky. So, like, I, I don't edit. I, like I said, I'm not a creation, creator. So, like, we do it. It's on Instagram and it's, it's done. But I love the way that builds communities. So, I don't know if you've heard of Bronze. So, Bronze is like an Afrofuturism themed restaurant in DC. I haven't. Ooh, I like that. Mm. At the end of April, Next week, Wednesday, Dr. Cyan Proctor, who is African-American woman astronaut, and she has a verse, but there's a way to structure it, so I don't want to get that wrong. And then two picture book authors who wrote book, like one wrote a book about Michelle Nichols, and one has a book called Impossible Moon about a little girl dreaming about going to the moon. So we'll be in conversation. The whole thing is like space sisters. So I'm really excited about that. I love that. Wait, what's the date? I'll put that in the show notes, folks. So I'll I'll come back to you and put that in the show notes. So then we'll we'll have it so folks know about it. Yeah. So I'm just I think they're like a lot of really cool sister sci-fi wind down Wednesdays. Things going on in the universe. <laughs> I'm ex- okay. I don't let me know if you you are also excited about this. So Netflix and UNESCO came together to produce a series of short of six short films and collectively they're called African I think folk tales reimagined. So it's like traditional African folk tales with a modern twist, which in my mind I'm like, oh it's Black Mirror, but like with African culture. That's what that's what I'm telling myself. Eight in launch yesterday, 
I have not watched it. I haven't heard of it, but the way you describe it, Black Mirror with Black culture, I'm, I'm here for it. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, I'm super excited. I'm just like, the trail, like the snippets from each of them seem really beautiful. So I'm just like, yeah. I'm just like, That's going to be the show notes too, guys. And that, and that might be my weekend, my weekend entertainment. So UNESCO and Netflix partnering on folk tales. And I'm sure they're, they're across the continent, I'm imagining. Yeah. So they're available for streaming globally. Yeah, so I saw an Instagram post from like Netflix South Africa and Netflix Nigeria. I did not see a Netflix concert, but it's they're supposed to be streaming globally, so I'm excited about that. I'm excited about um the next Spider Man because they'll have Spider Woman and the first Spider Woman is actually a black librarian. So I'm like, I'm here for it. I'm just like this is the animated one, like the Miles Morales and Issa Rae is supposed to be in it. I have anticipation for a Holly Berry as the Little Mermaid. So I want to be excited and I'm a little scared. So yeah, I mean, not not related to sister sci-fi, but I think for each one of those, I'm trying to drive a business initiative around it. So for the next one, we actually launched, there's an anthology called African Myths and Folk Tales that actually published in 2019. But if people are on the Netflix one, we're referring this anthology to give them deeper cultural context of what they see in the shorts. With Spider-Man, we might start carrying some of like the Spider-Man comic books. And for The Little Mermaid, one author that we've worked with in the past, JL, actually is writing a companion book called Against the Tide about like Haley Bailey's Little Mermaid character. And we'll be able to offer signed copies of that. So we'll be one of the few books and copies of that book. Cool. Folks, you got to follow Sister Sci. Like I said, I'm I'm a sci-fi fan, so I'm always hungry for those reading. Watch this space because I'm working on my own Afrofuturistic sci-fi series, so I'm here for it. So I always ask this question, like we know you and as this business person, which you've gotten a lot of um, intelligence on that. Who are you when you are not running Sister Sci-Fi? Are you a reader? Are you a watcher? Are you a listener? And it sounds like you're a lot, a bit of each. But tell us some of your favorite reads, watches, and listens, <laughs> and give us more knowledge because you've shared quite a bit. I'll say what I'm watching right now, the most genre, really, like since this is my genre related. So right now I'm watching The Good, Good Trouble, which is a spinoff of The Fosters, right? It's, I think, modern young people, shenanigans, they live in like this co-op together in downtown LA and why do they so what, what is that on? Is that on Netflix? It's, I watch it on Hulu. Hulu, okay. It's a form show. The Good Trouble. In terms of something within the genre, the broader genre, I finished watching The Last of Us, um, the zombie show. I think that's on HBO Max. The Last of Us, and just for anybody who hasn't watched it, does a really good job of making you fall in love with the character and killing the character. So just really <laughs> fall in love with the character no. and you die. Which if you, I don't think that's so much of a, it, it's a zombie apocalypse. So people die. I was like, you know, if they kill me one more kid. And then I was like, oh, this is how they do things out here in these streets. So the last one, okay. <laughs> I really enjoyed it. And I mean, I also like, I was going to watch it even if it was trash because I've watched any zombie show anywhere, even the wrong battle. In terms of books, I am buddy reading Nala Hopkinson's Skin Folk, which is a collection. I just watched Red Fisherman last night. And I was like, oh. Oh my gosh, that's my next. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely a fisherman in it. And I was I was like, oh, I was like, oh, Nala went in on this one. I'm actually discussing it tonight. Not as part of the sci-fi with a friend. We're discussing it tonight. So that should be an interesting discussion. Those are two good ones. Me- email me or message me. Let me know what you think when you read it. It's a lot. And I just finished reading The Virtuous Games. <clears throat> It to me, we'll talk to the author. I finished reading The Other Black Girl. Have you read The Other Black Girl? I haven't. Oh, looks like a good one. Yeah, my sister recommended it. And so basically the main characters are like, yeah, corporate America and and then shenanigans ensue. And I was like, <laughs> real talk. The, the author goes in about like all the microaggressions all the local races white people that she got to deal with. And I was like, how did you, and it's all in the publishing industry. So I was like, how did you get this published? Cause you calling out the people who go and publish it. But I just, I gotta, I gotta ask that question. Cause she, 
Oh, okay. That's an interesting one. Yeah. So I'll definitely check that one out. And then The Vicious Monsters is also like, it's more YA. The main character is dealing with hyper rich, hyper rich white people and, and that privilege and all that kind of stuff. It's a psychological horror and it's and kind of intense. Yeah. So that's everything that that's some of what I'm reading. In terms of what I'm listening to, I think Janelle Monet just put out a new single. Yeah, Flo, I love it. Listening to that. And then a lot of therapy for Black girls. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I love that podcast. I love Dr. Joy Bradford. Hey, y'all. This is Dr. Joy Bradford. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's the highlights of what I'm consuming. I consume a lot of media. <laughs> We always have really great show notes, folks. So you will have a lot of great show notes to be listening to. So yes, or not listening to um, options. You know, this will, if you're looking for a spring reading, listening and watching list, this is the episode for you. So yeah, we'll check that out. <laughs> Isis, this has been so wonderful. Thank you for being so generous with your time and uh, your energy. And I look forward to everything that's next for you. So before we sign off for the day, do you have any last thoughts that you'd like to share with our audience? This, yeah. I mean, I don't know about the audience because for some reason that's hard, but Florence, thank you so much for having me on the show. I really, really enjoyed it. I enjoy your energy. I hope we continue to collaborate and build together. So we'll brainstorm around that. Virtual is all the same to me. So hopefully we continue to collaborate. And I really, really. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so, so, so much. All right, folks, this has been another episode of the podcast. You can catch us Tuesdays with new episodes at com or wherever you get your podcasts. Please be sure to check out our guest in all of her socials, which will be in the show notes. Also, like, share, subscribe, leave us a review. It helps people find good content online. So until next time, bye for now.